Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Transitioning from a Primary to a General Election. We are going to talk about five things for you to focus on. It is just about a minute before noon, so we want to try to be respectful of people's time. So we're going to start right around noon and then get rolling. I'm joined by Carver here. We'll do some intros uh, in a second. Uh, just a, uh, maybe we'll wait one minute as people are joining. So we have a bunch of participants joining and we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to jump in. If you're just jumping in now, you haven't missed anything other than me yapping for a couple seconds. So we will get into the housekeeping and recording and all that stuff in just a minute. So um, neither Carver nor I sing very well. So we're just going to be quiet for just one minute while everyone is jumping into the webinar and we will be right back. All right. Chandra gets the prize for the first person to comment. There's no actual prize. We should probably really come up with the prize. Otherwise, it's it's not saying much there. <laughs> prize thanks. will be a recording of you singing, Craig. <laughs> that is definitely not a prize. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Again, we're going to get rolling. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes here. Uh, yes, this session will be recorded. So when this webinar is done, what we do is wrap up the recording. We add closed captions to make it more accessible. Uh, if we make any uh, grievous errors or mistakes, we will uh, correct those. I don't think we're going to be very heavy in calculations or anything like that here. Uh, but um, so we'll get that video ready. And then usually within 24 hours, it's ready to go out. Sometimes it's sooner, usually within a day, two days max. So uh, you'll get a recording of this. And you'll also get a copy of the deck. So the deck that we're using as the presentation here, you will get a copy of that. So don't feel like you have to take notes or, you know, rush to copy stuff down. We'll, we'll send it to you. As questions are being asked, we, we will be answering questions. So as Carver's chatting, uh, I'll answer questions. As I'm chatting, he'll answer questions. And then uh, if there are any unanswered questions at the end of the webinar, we wrap them up in an email and we'll send that to you as well. So uh, basically nothing should go unsaid at the end of this. If there are extra questions, we'll, we'll get to them one way or another. It might just take a day for us to confirm the answers and go from there. Uh, two things real quick. Uh, on your Zoom chat uh, icons, you will see the chat icon. That's for kind of conversation comments as we're moving along, responding to people, asking, uh, you know, we, we might be chatting with some of the other uh, participants here, that kind of thing. We'll also ask questions as we go along. I may ask questions and we could drop that there. Uh, so go ahead and do that. If you have a question related to the topic that is being presented, or you just have a random question, like, uh, is this concept valid in Pennsylvania as opposed to Michigan, things like that, drop that in the Q&A. The reason we use the Q&A is because when we're done with this, if there are any questions left open, we'll actually go through the Q&A and make sure that we get them all. Sometimes if we have a really engaging webinar, it's tough to go through a chat that has like a thousand line items and try to pick out the questions. So if you can, please drop the questions in the Q&A and then drop the chat in the chat, um, if that makes sense. So uh, can everyone hear me okay? Audio all right so far? Just, just drop in the chat real quick that we're good. We'll We'll just roll on. Sick. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it looks like we have a good group, uh, people from all over the place. Wow, someone from Kenya. That's yeah. very cool. Oregon, basically East Coast, West Coast. This is great. All over the place. Cool. Uh, perfect. All right. Well, uh, introductions. I'm Craig with NGP Van, and I'm joined by Carver Murphy, who's a campaign manager uh, working in, in Pennsylvania and some other places. And I'll, I'll just turn it over to him, let him introduce himself for a moment there. Yeah, great. Thanks, Craig. Um, happy to join everyone today um, from all over the country. Really exciting. Um, 
Craig mentioned, my name is Carver Murphy. Um, I am a, a political consultant, campaign manager based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, done most of my work in um, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. Um, grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I think I saw Judy Schwank, the senator from Reading, Pennsylvania, on the uh, on the participant list today. Um, so. Uh, we uh, uh, but went to Penn State. I've been in Pittsburgh for probably about four years now um, and working in politics for about seven years, last seven years. So mostly state and local um, stuff. Uh, and so I'm excited to you know share that experience with you guys today. Thanks, Carver. Uh, so the whole idea of this is what do you need to do to transition from your primary to your general election? And I know we're kind of in the middle of this right now, right? Every day we're inching closer to that to that general. <clears throat> there are different states that just had their primaries recently, so still relevant for a few. Here in Pennsylvania, this is a little bit further for us, but there are some states that even go back to March for their primaries. But um, the idea is that when you transition from a primary, no matter how much work you've done, right? Some, some people, um, they're the only person in the primary. So they're going to win unless they decide to drop out, right? Uh, and then other people, um, you know, don't want to spend a lot of money or don't have real competitive races. So they might not actually do some of the things that you might need to do to run a, a full force kind of general election. So you have to pick up after the primary and start doing that work. So, but the one thing that is really the same in all these races is that you need to do these things. You need to think about these things. You need to plan for these things. And there are issues that every campaign is going to face post-primary, whether you had a competitive primary or not, you've got to deal with things like cash flow because you're coming down to the wire. You have to make uh, expenditures and payments on things. You have to talk about fundraising. Uh, uh, most campaigns, if they run a competitive primary, they might not even have money left to go into the general. So kind of restarting that. Worrying about staff. Um, if, if budgets are low, resources are low, uh, do you lose staff? Did you have to lay people off coming out of the primary? How are you going to get them back to do the work that you need to do? Uh, if if you're running for uh, a bigger race or a bigger district and you have no staff or no volunteers, no helpers, it can be very tough doing all these things on your own. If you're in a tiny school board race, maybe you get by and it's a little bit easier to do. Or are you in a situation where you're flush, right? At Carver, maybe talk about a race where he actually raised more money than anyone ever expected uh, and was practically looking for ways to spend that money. Um, and then, which does not happen often, but you no. know, sometimes. <laughs> it's not sometimes. the norm. Yeah. But I, this, to this point, a lot of, you know, larger like statewide, maybe Senate or gubernatorial races, um, they will staff up immediately post-primary, especially if they uh, have been unopposed in the primary, like, you maybe when they start to hire their field staff so um again this is we're gonna i don't think for much of the conversation assume that you spent all your money and you ran a competitive primary yeah i mean one of the worst things is you know get into election day and you lose by 10 votes and you look at your bank account and you got fifty thousand dollars left in the bank and you wonder hey <laughs> what could i have done and it's always tough trying to figure out where that line is and where do you stop and where do you prepare? And, and you know, that's something that you, you get with experience, but something you definitely have to think about. And then finally, just uh, dealing with, with voters and volunteers and hopefully not apathy uh, among those two groups, but potential uh, depending on, on what your primary look like. So, you know, as uh, we're now past Labor Day, right, and people are just starting to come back from vacation. But, you know, as you get past your primaries in a lot of states, depending on where we all are, uh, sometimes you're you're jumping right into summertime, right? Where things are slow and families go away and it's hard to reach voters or harder maybe than it was in, in March or April or May. And it's hard to get volunteers who are also on vacation. So the whole idea of this is that you really need to restart the engine to keep everybody engaged. So where you were in the primary or, or before where you are now to where you need to be, you really need to ramp things up and you need to ramp them up quickly. We're going to cover a couple items here, four items in this presentation. We're going to discuss fundraising. We're going to discuss messaging. We're going to talk briefly about paid media, which is going to be focused uh, primarily on your fundraising, because if the funds aren't there, then it's tough to do paid media. And then jumping into organizing, which is really the one equalizing factor in all this, right? Because if you don't have fundraising and you're not able to do paid media, you can always organize or out-organize your opponent and still pull out a win, right? It's not like you can't win if you don't have money. There are myriad examples of uh, uh, campaigns winning 
on nothing other than organizing alone and doing it in a really smart way. Uh, so, so we'll talk about that, but essentially two items. And I think Carver is going to hit these home pretty well as we get into this. Yeah. Money is by far your most valuable resource and time is by far your most valuable resource. So um, these two will play off each other, right? They are equally at the same time, your most valuable resource, which is probably a physical impossibility, but it's true and it happens to be true. So um, if you don't have one, you really have to focus on the other and be really smart with, with the other to make sure that, that you're doing things as efficiently and pos as possible and giving yourself the best chance to win. So uh, I'm going to shut up for a few minutes and, um, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll explain this one real quick because this is a little bit deeper than, than uh, what we covered in the last slide. Some of the things that you need to do to restart the campaign engine, if you've been dormant for a little bit or just thinking about, hey, you've got this primary win and now you're moving over to the general. One of the first things that you, you have to look at and understand is, is where does your fundraising stand? And Carver will dive into this a little bit more deeply. Once we have an idea of that, we have an idea of what we can do and when we can do it and to the extent that we can do it. When we understand that, we can start thinking more again about messaging, uh, dropping polls, paying for polls to really understand the messaging and whether that's changed, right? Your, your primary voter base may be different than your, your general voter base. So it may be worth doing another poll or doing your first if you haven't done one already. If you don't have things like photos and videos to go along with your messaging, it might be a good time to do that revamping or looking at your email messaging, your overall social messaging, messaging on your website, things that you're getting out there, even your top issues, they may not change, but there might be more nuance in them now when you move from a primary to a general and are talking to a broader election base. And then defining your general opponent is something that Carver will go into detail here as well. And, and the big note here is it could be, and probably will be, much different than how you defined your primary opponent. So uh, we'll talk about why that differs uh, and how it differs because uh, it, it's not party on party anymore, right? And and not to say that you take the gloves off, but there may be reasons not to, uh, and we'll get into that. Again, talking about paid media and how it depends uh, on your fundraising, you may not be able to do it all, in which case you need to prepare for organizing and making sure you make the most of your volunteers. So that's kind of the order we're gonna take it in. It's kind of the order that, that we should be thinking about this and if all of these things are foreign to you right now, like, wow, I haven't even thought about fundraising. I haven't put a poll in the field. I don't have photos. The only photo I have is a Facebook photo of me and my kids when they were like, it was 10 years ago and I've got a bad haircut like I do now. Things like that. If, if that's what you're looking at, you need to get started now, right? So like all these things that we're going to show you when you get a copy of this deck, just check them off and get rolling because uh, it, especially... You know, we're in a situation where election is a couple of weeks away now, right? It's not like we have nine months left anymore. So so we're at the point where we're we're really trying to trade those resources for the time that we have left. So uh, with that said, I'm going to let Carver jump in here and, and, you know, get into start talking right at the top of the, the evaluating fundraising. Yeah, so fundraising. Um really is going to be your, um, I mean, we could probably harp on this all day. We could do a whole whole uh, presentation just on 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 fundraising but um really going to be your critical uh, decision making factor um how you know let's assume that you had a competitive primary election and you have spent nearly all of your money if if not all of it right um depending on what you're running for maybe you win and everyone's super excited to get in behind you and um maybe you're going to go flip a seat from red to blue um and it's gonna be the seat that decides whatever legislature you're running for some something like this right uh, so people are super excited to get behind the general election nominee and um maybe you get a bunch of money that comes in uh right after the primary in my experience that money does not just come like that um just because you won um it is really important to be prepared to capture it in that moment you're right you want to be I mean, I know everybody's like, I got to win my primary, I got to get ahead of it, like I got to, I got to get my doors knocked, GOTV, and now here in Pennsylvania, we've had a really interesting, we adopted vote by mail a couple of years ago, and um, so now we have an extended Geo, GOTV time, it's about a month long, as people are voting by mail as well, so you have this, a lot to do in the final month before your election. One of the things you need to do is make sure you're ready to capture whatever momentum you can from your primary victory. 
um, if that's making sure you've got a fundraising email ready to go um, or that you've got a list of uh, donors, top donors that you can call, your candidate can call the day after the election when everybody wants to sleep. Um, you're just, you got to get right back into it and say, hey, I won any money. Let's, we're ready to go. Um, and you got to start evaluating your budget. Um, you know, what is your new win numbers? Say you only had to talk to 5,000 voters in the primary, but you have to talk to 25,000 voters in the general election. That's a very different cost when, it when we're talking about digital advertising, very different cost when we're talking about a mailer to the universe. It's a very different cost um, when we're talking about, and we'll talk a little bit later, about the organizing capacity that you're going to need. Um, and those, um, that understanding that and being ready for that and starting right away is is going to be pretty key. Um, talking about how does this affect your cash flow and the implications on your expenses, Louis said, are you hiring field staff now because you've got so many more voters you've got to talk to? Are you hiring an extra fundraising consultant because you need to, um, or a call time manager because you've to do that much more fundraising work because you've got to pay for a big TV buy or something, right? These are uh, um, these are things you're going to need to know like pretty quickly, um, and and that is a bit of an art um, in <laughs> in the summer months. Um, there have been a handful of times, you know, I know at least one campaign I ran. We spent all of the money <laughs> in the primary, um, and we won the primary, and we were going on to a less competitive general election, but one that we still wanted to um, do some work and be present and do some campaigning for. Um, and I think I had to defer my salary payment for a month because as campaign manager, you know, I'd make sure my other, my staff got paid and um, we had no money today, so we had to raise it. Um, and so really having an understanding of what your expenses are moving forward, especially when you have almost no money um, and keeping those as low as possible is really important. Um, and then, you know, and we'll talk, I think, in the next slide, Craig, about messaging. Um, you know, yeah. what is your fundraising plan to make up that gap of, uh, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's what I need to spend my money on, both in the immediate and then in the long term. In Pennsylvania, our, our primaries are usually May. So we often, I kind of often conceive of the general election in two, two pieces, one the summer and then the fall, right? So pre post primary to Labor Day and then Labor Day to election. So post primary to Labor Day, usually not terribly expensive time for a campaign. And then Labor Day to the election is gonna be where like the bulk of your money gets spent. So knowing what your goal is for that second half of the general to be able to, to uh, you know what your gap is there and, and make a plan to do that. It's going to be really important. And in June, immediately post-primary, you have the time to do this plan, which is really important. Um, the, the inclination is going to be like, oh, let's take a break. And by the way, it's okay to take a break. It is okay to go on vacation for a week. You, you should do that. Um, and it's okay to do that. But take that time to prepare because you're not going to have it later. I just dropped in the chat a link to a budget uh, campaign budget template that that we put out. It's a free download. It's it's very comprehensive and and kind of goes through probably more than than you would need certainly on a local race. But uh, there's a lot of items there that can help you uh, understand what things you need to put in the budget. Uh, there are a lot of kind of blank numbers in there because you know staff in in Los Angeles might be uh, a different price than staff say in. Uh, you know, a suburb of Chicago. So you really got to kind of know those numbers, talk to people local to fill it in, but there's a lot of stuff there that you'll see. Um, all right, jumping over to messaging. Yeah, so messaging. So a um, couple things to, I think, understand on messaging. One, there are several mediums that you can um, put your messaging out with. Um, the first being knocking on somebody's door right, or, or calling them on the phone. Um, what is the message you have at the doors and on the phones? That's free, right? <laughs> um, and then understanding um, how you're gonna spend money behind your messaging. Um, usually that is in the post Labor Day to election day stretch. 
Um, we'll talk about why you might want to move that up a little earlier. Um, if you have the money to do so, put a poll in the field. Um, I worked on a race last year. I'll probably mention a few other times today uh, for state representative Arvin Van Kitt. It was one of the red to blue flips uh, in an open seat here in Pennsylvania that we needed to flip the state house. We've done that uh, with one with a one vote margin. The Democrats now have the majority. Um, in a week, I will be uh, electing the, the next Democrat to flip the state house again. Uh, and um, I'm working on the special election here. Um, one week from today. So um, when we worked on that race, um, we were looking at our budget and we did not have a competitive primary, which meant we actually had a lot of cash on our hand. Cash flow was not our problem. Um, but we knew that that race was going to be expensive. We knew we were going to spend a lot of money. It ended up being the most expensive competitive state house race in Pennsylvania. Um, and we spent about $1.3 million on the race. Um, and so considering that we were going to spend, you know, a nearly a million dollars in paid media. Uh, we did not want to do so without having spent the thirty thousand dollars it cost to do a poll, um, and know that we were putting money behind our strongest messages. Um, so, if you can do that, the best time to put a poll in the field is probably like late July, so that you can have it turned around and ready to go in, I would say, mid-August to beginning of September, all of your messaging. Um, putting that into email and and uh, your digital communications as well. Um, I know there are some, sometimes when you uh, will choose how you put your messaging, you may, may say something different on the doors than you say on television. Um, and and likewise. So um, all of those are important to understand, particularly from your poll, but also from the feedback your volunteers are giving you. And one of the most important things, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we go to organizing, is ensuring that your volunteers are getting the feedback loop of what you're hearing on the doors and, and how that's resonating in those conversations, um, because that's going to affect your, that kind of organic understanding of what your what's happening in your district is going to be really important. Um, Last year when we were working on that race, we had a lot of people, you know, we saw in the news media saying, oh, it's doom and gloom for Democrats, the economy is terrible, inflation is rampant. And in our district, which is a very relatively affluent suburban district, um, people were not feeling the pinch of inflation as much. And we were not hearing that from on the doors. And so what we were hearing from the news nationally very much disconnected from what we were hearing on the doors which was by and large abortion messaging. Um, and so we leaned into that with our paid media as well. And um, we're ultimately successful with that. One of the things we did um, that was really, really, um, I think critical, and this is why being able to fundraise so early matters um, and understanding your uh, paid media options in terms of how much is television going to cost, how much is um, digital advertising going to cost, how much is ma our mailers going to cost, is defining your general election opponent. Now, that message is probably going to be very different than your primary opponent. Um, perhaps, you know, you need to run to the left of your primary opponent in a Democratic primary and um, out liberal that person. Um, that could then present a challenge in the general election when you need to maybe go flip a purple seat. Um, and so understanding which messages you're gonna use, but then um, how those differ from your primary and your general election opponent. We looked at a, uh, last year, we looked at a memo from the Virginia Republicans in 2021, where they saw a pretty good success um, in flipping the the governor's race and um, some of the legislator legislative seats, and the memo basically said that they attributed their success to being able to define their opponents earlier, the the Democrats earlier than the Democrats started to define the Republicans, um, and so we were quite confident, and and it did end up happening this way, that our opponent was going to try to get out there early. We're actually still seeing it. Um, 
in that district, we're still seeing negative mailers every couple months just to try to like burn in a, a narrative of um, of the incumbent not doing the work. Um, I'm not sure that that's the most effective spending of money like a year and a half before the election, but they're trying to have this narrative exist, continue to exist. Um, and we saw our opponent went up on television about two weeks before we thought uh, they would, and we made the call because we had the money to do so, and we understood what we need, what our fundraising gap was and our fundraising capabilities, that we were going to go up and match them. Um, because we didn't want to be a, them to define us before we could define them. And I actually think we went up heavier than them, to, uh, which started to help define us and them. Um, I know there are some campaigns, I, I, I think uh, Bucks County's got a coordinated campaign right now. They've been on digital for since like February, March, um, digital running digital ads to define their opponents. Um, and they chose digital because it's a, a relatively light, easy spend um, and you can get a pretty good broad reach. Um, so if you can make those decisions, those are really good. Right, we've got, got a couple questions. questions. Yeah. Um, Mary asked, how do you determine a win number uh, when the post you're running for has several candidates, like vote for three of the following candidates? Um, and I, I'll, I'll say, you know, look, anytime you're doing win numbers, you, you have to go to historical votes, right? Unless, of course, this is the first time. Like if your city just implemented ranked choice voting, you might not have a lot of historical data to go back to. So I don't want to say it's completely wing it. You know, there are there's a lot of political science out there about how do you account for that. And, and I think there's a lot of differing opinions on the best way to account for that, although there is science behind it. So you can you can look up some of that stuff from some of the, the political units at some of the big universities on how you can do multi-primary win numbers, which is obviously a little bit harder than just a simple majority 50% plus one, and you can't lose, right? But I think the idea here, Mary, uh, who asked this question, is that um, it's always off of historical. So if you're in an area even that has not only multiple primary people, like maybe a school board vote for the top five or judge vote for the top three, if, if you're in a rank um, choice voting system, then um, it, it's a little bit different in, in terms of figuring that out. And then and then the, the, the future ones on top of that, the future votes. But you can always go back to historical. And if you have historical data in that in that area to understand what happened with candidates before you, because it's likely not only, you know, more than just one person. So it's a very tough question to answer, especially with the limited time we have. But check historical, check the voting mm -hmm. records as the first place to go. Yeah. For, uh, I mean, for then, example, if you have three out of five, you know, school board members, right, just look where that third person was. In, in every historical. And that's the number that you need to get every one of your candidates over. Right. Don't be the last. Right. Exactly. One question from uh, Jeff, say a campaign doesn't have the money to do a poll. What can you do to find effective messaging? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of national polling out there um, that if you dig in, you can find um, what's going on. Um, that, there's two things I'd say. One, really need to understand your district. Um, are you running in an affluent suburban, suburban district? Are you running in a in a gentrified urban center? Are you running in a, um, you know, maybe post-industrial white working class space? Are you running in a rural area? Understand your district. Um, because you cannot look at national polling and apply it, polling from suburban districts to a rural district, which you can do is apply pulling from other suburban districts to your suburban district um, to understand your district. This, the second thing I would say is, this is one of the reasons why, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, organizing is so important to do during the summer um, and, and not let volunteers and voters you know, become apathetic. You want that feedback loop from the doors. All politics is local. This is, you know, we say that all the time and, and it really, like, what are the people in your district worried about? The The best, best way you're going to know that is if you're having genuine conversations with those people. And you will find in this neighborhood, their trash doesn't get picked up every week. And they're really mad about it. And you could send a mailer directly to that neighborhood and say, my city council candidate promises to always make sure your trash gets picked up. If, if you do, I mean, and that's not even something, you're not going to find that in the poll. 
that's information, super hyper local stuff that you're going to get when you're on the doors. So those are the two best ways. You can look at some national po polling, apply it to your district as appropriate, um, and have the conversations with voters, and you will and get that feedback from your volunteers. And, and trust your gut um, to that. Yeah. We talked a little bit about fundraising, uh, some of the items, you know, to look at cash flow, that kind of thing. We talked a little bit about messaging. Uh, and the third item is to talk about paid media. And if uh, a little bit dependent, of course, if if you have a little bit of fundraising, you've got a little bit of money and resources to work with, uh, and you have a message that you want to get out there, or you've defined or are ready to define your opponent, paid media is the next thing that you, you may want to look at. So, Yeah, so like you said, highly dependent fundraising situation um and prioritizing these items can be difficult and and uh certain it is is a really interesting challenge um and um the cash flow around your um, paid media is is also an interesting challenge one of the first rules that you have to understand is do not go up on a paid media plan without a plan to finish it um you do not want to go up on television and then three weeks before the election run out of money and have to come off of television that basically means you just wasted all the money you spent on tv now you can throttle those things a little higher a little less that stuff you can do um digital advertising is great for that um it's incredibly flexible uh, it is pretty cheap to buy impressions, and uh, you can get pretty targeted with the voters that you're you're seeing. Um, mail is probably the most targeted advertising you can get um, because it gets directly put into the mailbox of the voter's address. Right, we every registered voter is registered at an address; they're getting your mail directly there. Um, I like to think of these things in buckets. Um, and it's important to like plan for your bucket, fill that bucket, fund it, and then move to the next one. You don't want to do a quarter of your ideal mail plan, a quarter of your ideal digital plan, and a quarter of television. That's not going to work. Um, so I probably would say, generally speaking, prioritizing mail and then digital and then television. Television has a very pretty heavy um, pretty steep buy-in. Um, it's pretty hard to, um, uh, get on TV and you're, if you're not spending like a hundred thousand dollars minimum, you're probably, and this depends on the market you're running in. Um, I mean, in Florida, it can cost a million dollars a week to run television ads across the state of Florida. There's like nine media markets that are huge. Um, so it depends on the size of your district, depends on the size of your budget. And also television is not necessarily the most targeted. Um, here in Pittsburgh, if we're running a state house race and we spend a bunch of money on TV, that those ads are going to be shown all over Western Pennsylvania. So um, it's not the most targeted uh, outreach. Um, but prioritizing those items as you're going to spend them and understanding where you might be able to go up or down on them um, can I add a mailer here? Can I, and, and how much is that going to cost me? If I go up, if I send my first mailer a week earlier, can I spread them out a little bit more to, to make sure that my message is getting covered across the weeks? Um, digital funders, like I said, there's a, a, a campaign here in Pennsylvania. They've been on digital from, I think, February. Um, and they made that decision because they knew that they could throttle it up and down to what they needed to do with it. And they've been able to define their opponents very early. Last year, Governor Shapiro's race, he was on television from, I think, April. Uh, and he actually started defining his general election opponent before they won their primary, uh, which was <laughs> an, an interesting choice. Now, his race also cost something like $60 million. So, um, you know, if you have $60 million, go on television for the whole year. But most people are not, are not going to be able to do that. So, uh, but really important to say, like, I got to fund my mail program first. I got to fund my digital program. And then I'm going to think about, can I do cable? Can I do broadcast? And can I do OTT? 
which is uh, the streaming services that you guys think, like Hulu and um, other other uh, related streaming services. Harv, we've got a question from Frank who asks, yeah. what's the most cost-effective, most efficient way to get out your message when your opponent has the ability to outspend you three to one? I'll, I'll give my opinion then. Would love yeah. to hear yours, but Frank, so... This, this is an interesting one, right? Like like many other things, and you're probably not going to like the answer. There, there's no magic bullet, right? And and things can change real fast. What's the most effective method right now might not be the most effective method in three days, and the message may change. So I would say, generally speaking, you know, it, it's tough to understand broadly anywhere in the country. Uh, TV is better than mail. Mail is always better than TV, or, you know, X is better than Y. What I think you have to understand is, First, what is the message that you're trying to get out? And then what's the best delivery method for that message, right? And I'll just give you an example real quick. And there's nuance even inside those delivery methods or delivery vehicles. For example, social media, there's maybe four or five really big platforms with access to millions of people, right? Probably 80% better coverage in, in most markets. There's different demographics just for that. Do I put something on LinkedIn? Do I put it on Facebook? Do I put it on Reddit? The answer to that question is different based on the age, the gender of, of the person you're going after, right? So all of that can have a big difference in, in where you go. Carver mentioned Florida having big you know, media markets, right? Like if you're in Miami, putting something on TV might be a good way to go. If you're in a rural area that has only one channel and no one watches it, TV might not even be an option for you, even if it usually is the most effective way to get something out there. So again, it's tough and I know it's not a great answer, like it always depends, but it always starts with the message. What are you trying to get out? To whom are you trying to get that out, right? Because if your answer is, my message needs to go to people that are mostly women age 70 and older, you might have a very specific target vehicle for the medium, right? As opposed to my message is about solely the environment, it's going to kids 20, I say kids, uh, adults 22 and under, that's a whole different place. So no matter what one is generally the most effective, what's right for your message might be totally different. I hope that helps. Carver, I'd I love think, your opinion on that. Yeah, too. I'd love to add on to that. I mean, I, there's a couple other things. I mean, it is all age dependent. I'd say it's also district dependent. So um, an, another one of the cheap ways to get your message out there that we haven't really mentioned because we mostly use it in a more of a field context, but is text messages. Um, and actually there was an interesting political article the other day about um, Ron DeSantis's campaign using, uh, they're paying a, basically paying a premium for text messages that can deliver video uh, to get their TV ads in front of primary voters. So they're texting the video of their ad to their primary voters. And they're paying more money to do that than a normal text message, which is like two cents, um, to do that because they're delivering videos. But um, they're finding that that is uh, burning in their message and people are actually receiving it there. So depending on your message, um, or depending on your, your audience, right, they may receive the message in a different way. Um, I ran a statewide campaign. We certainly did not have the money to mail to the entire state. So we were digital first. Um, and that's because we could, that was the best bang for our buck in a digital, um, in a, in a Pennsylvania's got like 8 million voters um, in, in that context. And then, you know, I, uh, there's also countywide campaigns where some of them go TV first because television's even cheaper than to, to kind of cover our whole market might be cheaper than sending a mailer to 1.3 million people that are here in Allegheny County. So um, it definitely depends on the size of your district too. I, I would add one more thing just to, I, I hate giving the the broad general answers, but it, it's worth it. I think there's a, there's a book that I love. If you haven't read it, it's called GOTV, right? It's called Get Out the Vote. And it was written by two political scientists that go back decades with data, analyzing literally thousands of campaigns. And they advertise, they advertise, they uh, analyze all the different methods of campaign work, whether it's knocking on doors, mail, text messaging, social media, paid ads, things like that. And they break it down in a way that is really practical. And basically what it does is it says, if you do this method, what can you expect for spending a dollar? They bring it back to the spending of $1, right? What can you expect 
to get in terms of a vote uplift. So if you do mail, what's your vote uplift? If you do advertising, what's your vote uplift? So if you look at it that way, I've got $100 to spend. In general, what is the most efficient thing? That book, Get Out the Vote or GOTV, uh, lists that in table form and then goes into the science behind it. If you haven't read that book, it's really a great one to take a look at for a, very, uh, for a setting like this and a, a scientific analysis. Cool. Uh, let's jump over to organizing. Um, again, real quick, I want to put this up here and then Carver, I think we'll hammer this home again, is... Money is your most valuable resource. And at the same time, time is your most valuable resource. So uh, all the things we've talked to up to this point require some sense uh, or not sense, a reality of, of money or resources. The one thing that doesn't require that necessarily uh, is organizing. So if you're low on funds, this is where you've got to focus. So, um, and Carver mentioned apathy and, and really trying to keep people engaged. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll turn it over here and let Carver continue on this topic. Yeah, um, I, I think the one thing maybe to say just before we move to the next slide is if you don't have time uh, to organize volunteers to do this work, money can pay people to do this work and uh, can 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 solve your time problems. So these two things, these two resources will will solve each other um, depending on what you have. Um, and then probably about the next one, Craig. Yeah. So again, we're re we've re let's take it back. We've revisited our win number. We we understand that um, we're running a school board race. We've got three uh, three candidates that all need to get over 500 votes, um, and so that means they've got to knock X amount of doors to talk to those 500 voters and confirm them as supporters or convince them to be supporters, um, and then uh, it, we 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 start with that win number and we walk back. So we say, okay, I've got my win number, 500 voters. Um, how many uh, positive IDs do I have for my primary election? I can use those, right? Those people, I wanna just get them to go back and vote for me in the general. Um, and say that's 300 IDs. So now we need 200 more IDs. Um, that means that we need to probably knock on thousand doors. Um, if we're going to talk to 20% of the people we're knocking on their door, um, because most people just don't answer or they're not home or whatever. Um, and so we're going to walk that back. Thousand doors uh, is probably about 20 door knocking shifts. So pretty easy for someone to manage. You could do that by yourself in a school board race. Obviously, it's a very small number. Most of your races are going to be a larger numbers, but um, it's literally that math of just walking it back um, from your win number. Uh, and if that is a congressional race or a statewide race, um, you know, then that number is going to be maybe very big. And you're going to want to talk about how do I hire staff to help me organize these volunteers? Obviously, the candidate can't do, if you're running for Congress, you can't go talk to, like, what now, 800,000 people per district or something like that. Um, you can't talk to all of those people as one candidate, you're probably going to need a, a relatively large staff um, that help you organize um, and knock on doors and get volunteers to come out and knock on doors too. But basically every win number can be broken down to, I need to talk to this many people. It's going to take this many door knocking shifts. And that's how many people I've got to recruit to come out and, and, and talk to me and talk to voters every week. It's also um, important. And, yeah. When ahead, when you get to a point, you know, having an idea, everything stems from your campaign plan and, and your win number, but having an idea of where you are, right? Taking a moment to look into your metrics and say, you know, we're three months out from the election and saying, um, I need 10,000 votes to win. And right now I've only deed, you know, 2,000. That might not be bad, right? You, you've ID'd 20% of your win number with a couple months left. But if you get maybe six weeks from the election or maybe four weeks from the election and now you're only at 25%, is that a good number or a bad number? You know, that's up to you. It depends on how things go. If you're five days before the election and you've only ID 25%, you might, you know, be in for a bad surprise. But I think you have to look at your metrics and understand where are we in relation to, to the election? Where are we with our organizing? If you do your calc and your calc says you need a hundred volunteer shifts and you've only done five of them and you've only got two weekends left, you know, so 
the earlier you start this, the better, right? And sometimes that's tough to hear, especially when it's so late. But put your plan in place and then look at your metrics, put them in a spreadsheet and say, this is where I need to be with my volunteers. This is where I need to be with my IDs. This is where I need to be even with my spending. And if you're up or down on those numbers, pull your team in and have a conversation about what needs to be done to either get back on track or just continue kicking butt. And I'll I'll add like that door knocking, particularly early, it can really, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but really can go back to how do we define our opponent earlier? How do we define ourselves earlier, even without spending money on that stuff? Um, uh, the candidate I worked for the last year knocked 13,000 doors in the year, 13,000 doors. That's basically every accessible door in his state house district. And when our opponents started saying, all the, you know, all the socialists are coming and the, you know, all whatever the crimes coming from the city to the suburbs and all these kind of radical, more radical talking points trying to paint our candidate as a, as, as further left than this, what is a really moderate purple district. Um, people that didn't, that didn't click. People said, no, I met him on the doors. I, I or he, he was on my ring camp. Was, <laughs> was one we got a lot. He's, you shut up on my ring camera. Um, and and so people's understanding of our candidate was already something different before our opponent even was able to try to define us. And the door knocking that our volunteers did and that our candidate did helped helped do that for us. Um, and that that I think was one of the critical pieces of the whole thing, um, and and you can just get ahead of that by using the time you have, even if you don't have money. Yeah, just another example of of some of that messaging and, and trying to figure out what your message needs to be. I know we talked about polls once before uh, earlier before. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about doing what Carver's saying, getting out early, knocking on doors, even running polls trying to take the pulse of the electorate in your district is super important. And, and and again, it doesn't need to be with a poll because you can get those conversations like what Carver's talking about. I had an experience where um, I was working in a, a local election in a local race and had been door knocking for weeks for a particular candidate. And um, this was for a municipal role, but every person that, that I ended up talking to in the door had questions about school board and had questions particularly about school costs and school taxes, because that was in the news. And it was all over. And what we found was that a lot of the electorate actually didn't understand the difference between the school board and the municipality and, and why they were different or how taxes was di were different. So the candidate had actually done a lot of work to explain the differences between those two, held a couple town hall meetings, and was basically part of his message was just educating people on local civics. That was a message that was really well received, and we wouldn't have even thought to use that tactic had we not been out knocking on doors and trying to understand what was tripping people up. It didn't seem like uh, uh, like a big thing at the time, but it turned out we got comments about that. Just addressing some of those base questions was, was a message that we would have never thought to put out, and we got comments on it later. And I'll add, um, in 2020, when COVID hit, uh, I was working on the state house race, highly contested state house race in pennsylvania we raised something like nine hundred and twenty thousand dollars over the course of the year way more than when people expected us to um we had a poll in the field we had messaging that that we put our money behind um what we didn't have was door knocking um because covid hit we were we weren't knocking on any doors um we were doing some lit dropping but that's not effective in terms of the feedback and so um we we lost relative well, not terribly close um but one of the things you know sort of in in retrospect of why we we talk when we think about why did we lose what happened here and you know one of the things that we obviously was out of our control because there was a pandemic but was we didn't have the feedback on the doors we didn't really know beyond our flash in the pan poll of what people were thinking about and concerned about and worried about and and wanted to see from their state state house so i'm not really sure there was much we could do to um change that in that situation but that was definitely a place where we didn't have that tool cool i think this is the last section then we'll maybe get to some questions but just talking real quick and i think you hit some of this before carver 
We talked about, you know, trying to understand fundraising uh, with money being an important resource, the most important resource, and then time being the most important resource. If you don't have the money, you really have to lean heavily on volunteers. So, you know, just trying to understand what your, your volunteer situation is. You know, did you have volunteers in the primary and have they gone away? Um, you know, did you just ask your volunteer to come and do data entry, right? Because while it's important, you want to keep them engaged, you know, give them small things to do that they can they can find big wins so that they want to come back. And then in other campaigns, <clears throat> if you need volunteer leaders, give them big things to do uh, and let them tackle those things and, and really put their skills to use. Um, if you need to reboot your volunteer program, go back to your messaging. Uh, do you have new messaging? If not, create it and, and start getting that out there. Uh, use your mail program, use NGP. Uh, use social media, but you, you need to call those volunteers to get to do all the work you need to do so that you can hit your win number. <clears throat> local Democratic committees are a great uh, resource for volunteers, obviously, because at the local level, like Carver said, politi all politics is local. Um, those meaningful messages to the local committees, make sure you're getting in there and talking to them. Even if you don't have a relationship with them, they want to know you. So get in there and make sure you have that conversation. Um, your local progressive groups, colleges and universities are, are great areas for uh, for picking up volunteers. Uh, and then, of course, if, if you don't have the money or I'm sorry, if you do have the money and you don't have the time or the ability uh, to put a big volunteer program in place, there's always paid organizers, which can do everything from getting signatures to knocking on doors and, and things like that. So um, something to think about there as well. Anything you want to add on top of that, Carver? I've, I've just had plenty of cases where, you know, I was wasting time by dropping off lawn signs. Promote a lawn sign count and, and, and like let a really engaged volunteer, especially if it's somebody who just isn't comfortable knocking on doors or making calls, talking to voters. Like, what's the way they can help? Um, I've also had really great volunteer organizers, um, college kids and um and it's always college kids and little old ladies, which is the, the secret to democratic politics. Um, you know, it, I, I actually, in both cases, I've had campaigns where I've hired a little old lady to be my field director. Or I've hired a college kid to be my uh, my field director because they were like, they were they were excited doing the work. And you got, after only a couple of weeks, you can real, you can get a sense that this person can just do this work and, and give them the responsibility, give them the buy-in. Great. Cool. Let's go to uh, let's go to questions. I think that's most of the, the data here. Again, we'll have a copy of the video within 24 hours. The deck, we put closed captions on the video. So that usually takes a little time in the uh, video, the team that's going to handle that. But um, oh, let me put up a poll. I want to actually put up two polls just to understand because I forgot to do this the whole time. So we're going to do it here, hopefully, before everyone leaves. But um, let's launch this one. We're going to do two or three polls real quick before everyone takes off. And then if you have questions, start dropping them in, in the Q&A and we can answer them before. But, you know, who here is in the general election race this fall? I should have launched this as the first one before we got to the end. But just curious to know who's who's in a general or people maybe just checking out this webinar, like, hey, this is going to be good planning for next, next year or next cycle, that kind of thing. Cool. All right. I'll end that. I'll pop that. Uh, pretty even. Not too bad. Yeah, most people not just checking out. That's good. Uh, okay, I want to do another one, right? Uh, out of those who are here, let me see if I can launch this. Uh, stop sharing the first one. I'm going to put a second poll in place. Whoa, hold on. Uh, let me speed through to the end so you can see contact information. Uh, where are we go? Okay. So who has a campaign plan? Because a lot of the questions here were based on, you know, how to do things, how to look at win number, very foundational stuff. I'm curious out of the group here, who's actually put together a campaign plan? Who has something like a document that they're working off of? Okay, great. Most people, that's really good. Everything comes back to your campaign plan and campaign plans are living documents. They change, right? And they will change. Where you start in your primary, even where you, if, if you continue from your primary to your general, month to month in the general, your campaign plan could change. I mean, your foundations aren't going to change. What you stand for won't change, but your numbers can and will likely change. Um, okay, great. And real quick, I'm going to throw one up. We we don't like to spam people. So, you know, um, I really appreciate Carver's, um, you know, working with us on this and adding all his information. He's uh, a fantastic campaign manager who's worked on some great races. A lot of these um, 
you know, we don't just like to blanket, you know, hit people, spam people with contacts, but we do these with our partners like Carver to understand, uh, you know, to get experts in, to have commentary on, on a lot of things that are important. And then we like to kind of just get out of the way. So, you know, if you'd like to talk to Carver directly, or if, you know, whether or not you're in Pennsylvania, if you'd like to get some advice on something and Carver can help, or if you just want to chat with him about some of the concepts here, you know, just let us know, and then we'll get your information directly to him so that he doesn't have to contact everybody on the list, and then it's spam. So just let us know here, and then, um, perfect, thanks. And then we'll shoot that over to him so he can have separate follow-up, or you could ask your individual questions, and he can answer them. Great. We have and, one and more question. Really anyone can feel free to email me there at my email, carver, carvermurphy.com. Cool. Uh, uh, Kamika asked a question about getting into some races in Florida as political direction and support, how can you do that? Uh, Kamika, great, great question. Um, so if you're looking to get into this kind of as a career or even just volunteer help out, I would say um, if, if you know a good candidate, that's the best place to go, right? Start with that candidate and just start helping out. If there's someone who is espousing a position that that you believe in, you know, climate or uh, climate justice or economic justice or reproductive justice, whatever it is, a lot of justice. Um, if, if someone is espousing that that issue that you believe in too, um, pick up with them, you know, um, kind of throw your hat in that ring and do it as a paid contributor or a volunteer contributor, start off as a volunteer, then go to paid, um, or, you know, kind of hang out your own, your own shingle and, and start to do that work. Um, obviously it helps to get experience, to understand the motions of a campaign from developing a campaign plan to, uh, figuring out win numbers to messaging, dealing with the press, vote, organizing, things like that. It's great if you start with a local campaign, learn, and then, and then move up. The second thing I would say is um, uh, touch base with your local Democratic committee, and they always have candidates running, right? So, you, you know, Carver's in a special right now, right? Um, Carver's mm -hmm. been around in, in Pennsylvania, like he said, for years working on different campaigns at a very high level, and it has developed a reputation in doing that. And, and you know, a lot of business or, or campaigns and candidates, you know, will seek him out. Um, it I, takes time I think in the last seven years, I've only gotten one job by putting a resume into a resume bank oh. all of it has been networking um and and i guess i'll say the way that i got in too is i worked in state senator judy schwank's uh uh district office she's on she was on at least on earlier she's not still on um and uh and i'd worked in her district office for a summer in between uh semesters at college and um, want to get an understanding of what the official side of the political realm looked like. And then I did that. And then after that, I, it was 2016, big campaign year. Um, and I, uh, turned around and, and said, okay, let me understand the campaign side of politics. And I found, um, my aunt and uncle live up in Massachusetts. They knew a guy who was running for state Senate. Um, and, they said, come live with us for the summer and work on the race and we'll connect you. And they connected me to the campaign. And that was kind of all she wrote. I was thrown right in um, as a unpaid volunteer. I think they paid for my gas, <laughs> like paying for gas. So I was driving around, that was it. And um, by the end of the summer, they had, I had a title and had a salary um, with the campaign because I had just done with the work. We'd raised some money. And um, so that's kind of how I got through so certainly just networking can do it. Um, and uh, I think, Miki, you said PA, uh, you can, I mean, certainly feel free to email me and I'm happy to talk to you about um, folks that maybe we can connect you to in Pennsylvania that, that can um, help you find jobs or, or whatever, or, or help you find whatever you're looking for. Yeah. Cool. Thank you again, Carver. Appreciate it. Again, I want to be respectful of people's times and we're coming up on the hour. We will send this deck out and the video out. Look for that in the next 24 hours. If you don't see it, you know, feel free to uh, send me a note and uh, Carver's email I just dropped in the chat. We'll send a copy of the chat out to everyone too. So you all have it, but um, thank you again. We have a few more webinars coming up over the next couple of weeks. Just check out NGP Van's website and you'll see everything there. Appreciate all your time and uh, good luck. Good luck this cycle. Not too much time left. So uh, good luck out there. We'll see you again soon. And then it starts all over again. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It starts all over. So hopefully earlier, hopefully earlier for 20. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks.